the Civil War battle series, Jeb Stewart's charge at Gettysburg. The Battle of Gettysburg, a turning point in the American Civil War, is often remembered for its infantry clashes and Pickett's daring charge. Yet amidst the thunder of cannons and musket fire, another episode unfolded less prominently but with significant consequences, Jeb Stewart's cavalry charge on the third day. Analyzing this event reveals not only its tactical impact, but also its broader implications for the Confederate cause and the legacy of Stuart himself. General Stuart, renowned for his audacity and flair, was entrusted with flanking Lee's army and gathering crucial intelligence. However, his two-day detour to raid Hanover, Pennsylvania, deprived Lee of critical information about Union positions, arguably contributing to the disastrous Confederate attack on Cemetery Ridge. Returning late to the battlefield, Stuart sought to redeem himself with a bold cavalry charge against Union cavalryman George A. Custer. On July 3rd, Stewart's cavalrymen erupted from the forested slopes, sabers flashing in the sun, against Custer's Michigan Wolverines. The clash was fierce, a whirlwind of blades and pistol fire. Though outnumbered, Stewart's veterans managed to push back the Union troopers, momentarily achieving a tactical victory. However, they failed to break through the Union lines and reach the rear, their objective unfulfilled. The charge itself had minimal impact on the overall battle, already decided by Pickett's failed assault. Yet, it carries an undeniable historical weight. The controversy surrounding Stuart's absence in the critical hours beforehand and his choice to prioritize the Hanover raid cast a shadow over his actions. Critics claim his vanity outweighed strategic necessity, potentially costing the Confederacy a chance at victory. Others argue that Lee, aware of Stuart's strengths and weaknesses, entrusted him with the discretion to maneuver as he saw fit. Stuart's tragic death only months later, mortally wounded in a skirmish just days after Gettysburg, solidified his legend as a dashing hero, but also cemented the debate surrounding his performance at Gettysburg. Was he a reckless daredevil who prioritized glory over duty, or a skilled opportunist who, despite his missteps, remained a valuable asset to the Confederate cause? For some, Stuart's charge embodies the desperate bravery of the Confederacy in its waning days, a fleeting glimmer of hope extinguished by Union firepower. For others, it signifies a fatal disregard for strategy and intelligence, ultimately contributing to the South's downfall. Regardless of its interpretation, the charge at Gettysburg remains a poignant chapter in the story of the war, raising questions about leadership decision-making, and the fickle nature of fortune on the battlefield. An angry gloom hung like dust over the 6,000 Confederate cavalrymen trooping up the York Turnpike in the early dawn on July 3, 1863. After eight long and largely unproductive days in the saddle, the horsemen were setting out on a last-ditch effort to disrupt and disarrange the rear of the Union Army confronting General Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia at the tiny crossroads town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. A blood-red sun, always an evil portent to experienced campaigners, shone directly into the men's eyes, and the damp summer heat was already soaking through their short, gray uniform jackets. It was clear to everyone that the day would only get hotter, literally and figuratively, before it was over. No one was angrier or gloomier than the trooper's famous commander, James Yule Brown Stewart. The day before, the flame-bearded young general had sauntered into Lee's headquarters tent on Seminary Ridge at Gettysburg, expecting the usual courtly greeting from his old friend and mentor. 
Instead, an obvious angry Lee, worn and distracted by two days of unparalleled savagery, with nothing to show for it but a bloody stalemate, glanced sharply at Stuart with cold, dark eyes. General Stuart, where have you been? he asked briskly. When Stuart attempted to describe his recent whereabouts, Lee cut him off with a withering look. I have not heard a word from you for days, he said, and you are the eyes and the ears of my army. Embarrassed observers said later that Stuart looked as though he had been slapped in the face. He accepted the rebuke with a lowered head. The fact that both men shared the blame for Stuart's untoward absence made the meeting no less uncomfortable. Lee, as was his increasing habit, had given Stuart a vague, all-encompassing order to pass around the Union Army massed below the Potomac River in northeastern Virginia and collect all the supplies you can for use by the Army. At the same time, he had directed his 30-year-old cavalry commander to screen Lieutenant General Richard Ewell's Second Corps as it advanced into Maryland and to break off his expedition if he ran into any hindrance from the Federals. Having made a household name for himself a year earlier by riding completely around the similar Union Army under Major General George B. McClellan in Virginia, Stuart intended to duplicate that noteworthy raid. He and his men never considered Union soldiers, whether cavalry or infantry, a particular hindrance to their plans. The still painful memory of the drawn cavalry battle at Brandy Station, Virginia, three weeks earlier gave added motivation to the Southern riders. Beginning on June 25th, Stewart's horsemen rode east from Salem, Virginia, intended to turn north and link up with Yule around York, Pennsylvania. In the meantime, Lee's massive army began moving northward as well, mounting its second invasion of enemy soil in nine months. The first invasion had ended badly at the Battle of Antietam. Lee intended the second one to go much better. For that to happen, he needed accurate information from his cavalry arm, but for once he was let down in his expectations. The Brigadier General Stuart left behind to guard Lee's flank, Beverly Roberts and William Grumble Jones, were not up to the task. Lieutenant General James Longstreet, commanding Lee's First Corps, complained later with some justice that Stuart had left them his least favorite officers. Stuart could scarcely argue with that assessment. He considered Robertson by far the most troublesome man I had to deal with, in no small part because Robertson had been a former suitor of Stuart's wife, Flora, and a protege of much-despised father-in-law, Union Brigadier General Philip S. George Cook in the Old Army. The quick-tempered Jones had more than lived up to his name of Grumble on numerous occasions, and although he was a better general than Robertson, he was outranked by the other officer. In the confused command situation, each failed to notify Lee that the Union forces had broken camp and set out after him. As long as Stuart was out of touch, Lee was effectively flying blind, hardly the best way to begin the most crucial campaign of the war. Meanwhile, free of his unlikable subordinates, Stuart galloped east with his battle-tested troopers. Stuart sent his most reliable scout, John Singleton Mosby, ahead to map out the best route across Maryland into Pennsylvania. Mosby, who would later win fame as the Grey Ghost, leading the 43rd Battalion of Virginia Cavalry on numerous independent raids in northern Virginia, reported back that Stuart could pass easily around the widely dispersed Union Army in western Maryland. It was a dangerously upbeat assessment, and it cost Stuart several hours when he discovered that the Federals had already moved out and occupied the road of Haymarket, Virginia, on which Stuart had expected to move. Had Stuart returned to Lee then, or at any rate, reported the enemy movement, it might have changed the entire course of the campaign. Instead, Stuart was content to graze his horses in a field nearby while the unsuspecting Federals passed unimpeded. 
Crossing the Potomac at Rouser's Ford, Stewart tore up a portion of the C&O Canal and swooped down on 125 enemy supply wagons at Rockville, Maryland, driving the fleeing Teamsters all the way to the outskirts of the nation's capital at Washington. Instead of burning the wagons and continuing with all haste to join Ewell's vanguard, Stewart wrongly decided to hold on to the bulky wagons and their treasure trove of ham, sugar, and whiskey. This was the very definition of a hindrance, but Stewart casually ignored Lee's injunction and continued northwestward, farther and farther away from Lee's army. Two days later, Lee was still telling Brigadier General Isaac Trimble, I have not yet heard that the enemy have crossed the Potomac and am waiting to hear from General Stewart. He would continue waiting for several days. While their infantry comrades stumbled blindly into a major confrontation with the Union Army of Major General George Gordon Meade south of Gettysburg, Stewart's horsemen wasted precious hours tearing up a six-mile stretch of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and paroling the 400 prisoners taken at Rockville. The hungry and thirsty mules pulling the captured wagons became increasingly unmanageable, a source of unmitigated annoyance, according to Stewart's aide, Lieutenant William Blackford. Repeated clashes with screening Union cavalry further impeded Stewart's progress. In one close-run encounter near Hanover, Pennsylvania, Stewart had to leap his horse, Virginia, across a 15-foot deep gully to avoid capture or death. Meanwhile, an anxious Lee paced about his tent, asking new arrivals, Have you heard anything about my cavalry? Any news to give me about General Stewart? For several days, the answer to both those questions was a dispiriting no. At last, on the afternoon of July 2nd, Stewart's column finally reached the outskirts of Gettysburg. Locating Lee's headquarters on Seminary Ridge, the weary cavalrymen entered and saluted his commander. Well, General Stewart, you are here at last, said Lee, before delivering his terse, devastating rebuke. With Lee's clipped words ringing in his ears, Stewart headed out again the next morning, marching northeast, then south, across the open countryside between the Hanover Road and Baltimore Pike. Colonel Milton Ferguson's brigade led the advance. At Crest's Ridge, a long, low hill overlooking the farm south of the York Turnpike, Stewart stopped to take stock of the situation. After scanning the surrounding countryside, he sent Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Witcher's 34th Battalion forward to seize a nearby farm and fence line owned by local farmer John Rummel, half a mile to the east. While Stewart's skirmishers were creeping forward, his blue-clad counterparts in the Federal Cavalry had not been inactive. Brigadier General David McMurdy Gregg, a native Pennsylvania, commanding the 2nd Division, moved swiftly to block the dangerously open terrain north of the Baltimore Pike, asking Cavalry Commander Brigadier General Alfred Pleasanton for an additional brigade to help safeguard the position. Pleasanton agreed, sending Gregg, a grass-green young brigadier general named George Armstrong Custer, from the 3rd Division to assist in the defense. Custer, the goat of the 1861 graduating class at West Point, had worn his general stars for only a few days, but already he had made a name for himself among Union horsemen. One of the three boy generals promoted by Pleasanton in early June to give more youthful on to the cavalry, the 24-year-old Custer was a natural-born self-dramatist, wearing a gaudy, non-regulation uniform that he had designed himself of black velvet trimmed with interlocking gold lace on the sleeves, a wide-collared navy blue shirt, and a bright red necktie, Custer ensured that he would always be the most colorful officer on any battlefield. Long blonde hair falling nearly to his shoulders completed the Corsair look. His command greeted his arrival with veteran humor. Who is the child, they joked. Where is his nurse? 
After helping beat back Stuart's advance at Hanover, Custer won their grudging respect. Now they called him the Boy General of the Golden Locks. Gregg placed Custer's division, composed of all Michigan troops from the 1st, 5th, 6th, and 7th regiments, at the intersection of the Hanover and Low Dutch roads. Custer positioned the 5th and 7th regiments facing north, in an open field where the two roads crossed. The 6th was farther west along Little's Run, a shallow stream flowing south from the farm. Dismounted scouts reached the base of Cress's Ridge and dashed back to report that two brigades of rebel cavalry, supported by artillery, were moving through the trees on the high ground, little more than a mile away. Custer immediately wheeled about six mounted artillery pieces served by his old West Point friend, Lieutenant Alexander Pennington. Four quick rounds from a Confederate parrot rifle ripped through the air. Union Colonel John McIntosh, commanding Gregg's 1st Brigade, rode up to Custer and asked for a summary report of the enemy's location. I think you'll find the woods out there full of them, Custer replied with a smirk, pointing toward Cress's Ridge. McIntosh dismounted skirmishers of his own from the 3rd Pennsylvania, 1st New Jersey, and Purnell Legion. Custer and McIntosh were in the process of organizing a defensive line when a literally earth-shaking blast began two miles away. Seeking to soften up the Union Center, preparatory to the desperate frontal assault that would become known as Pickett's Charge, mass Confederate cannons had begun to unleash the largest display of concentrated artillery fire ever heard on the North American continent. The ground shook beneath the Union cavalrymen, and the smoke rolled across the valley beyond. It appeared as though the very woods around them had been set on fire. The world seemed to be coming to an end. Whether by coincidence, design, or sheer inspiration, Stuart launched his own attack shortly after the ear-splitting cannonade began. His plan, he explained later in an after-battle report, was to keep the enemy pinned down in front by sharp-shooting skirmishers while sending his mounted forces around to attack the enemy left. The strategy began unraveling almost as soon as it began. By an oversight on the part of their acting brigade commander, Witcher's men had advanced with only ten rounds of ammunition apiece. They quickly expended all their rounds in a nasty firefight with members of the 5th Michigan in 1st New Jersey, and pulled back to Rommel Farm to await reinforcements. Stewart had been hoping to keep his mounted brigades hidden while they formed ranks and drove into the Union flank, but the battle seemed to be quickly getting away from him. Shoring up Witcher's skirmish line, he sent Brigadier Generals Wade Hampton and Fitzhugh Lee into the fray. The southern horsemen in columns of four galloped across the open field below Rommel's farm and crashed into Custer's right flank. Peppered by fire from Witcher's newly replenished battalion, the 5th Michigan fell back in disarray toward their artillery. Gregg, watching the battle unfold, ordered the 7th Michigan, which had been standing in reserve, to mount a counterattack. Custer, reacting swiftly for a neophyte brigade commander, drew his sword, reared up in a saddle, and cried, Come on, you wolverines! Spearheaded by a 21-year-old regimental commander, Colonel William D. Mann, the 7th Michigan troops directed a relentless pistol fire at the Confederates, who had taken cover behind a low post and rail fence. The retreating members of the 5th Michigan stopped dead in their tracks to watch the attack. The two sides came together with a sound like falling timber. So violent was the collision, reported Captain William E. Miller of the 3rd Pennsylvania, that many horses were turned end over end and crushed their riders beneath them. Miller himself reported receiving a slight scratch actually a bullet through his arm. The fence broke up the charging Union column into jelly, mixing us up like a mass of pulp. The two sides flailed at each other with sabers and blasted away with pistols and carbines. It was literally hand-to-hand -hand combat. When Farmer Rummel returned to his home after the battle, he found two dead men laying in the lane amid thirty dead horses, their stiffened fingers still embedded in each other's lifeless throats. 
Thinking quickly, some of the Michiganders leaped off their horses and leveled a piece of the fence, allowing the rest of their mounted comrades to pour through. Kill all you can and do your best for each other, man urged. Custer led the 7th Michigan forward, aiming at a rebel battery posted just below the Rummel Farm. At them we went, every man for himself, boasted coincidentally named Captain George Armstrong. The 7th Michigan from the Grand Rapids area was the least experienced regiment in Custer's brigade. Most of the men had seen only patrol duty since arriving at the front two months earlier. They soon got the worst of it with the more battle-savvy Confederates who clung to the necks of their horses like Comanche Indians and fired at them from below with their pistols. Everyone was screaming like banshees. Sabres thudded in the skulls with a sickening sound of sticks bursting a ripe watermelon. The fight, desperate but unequal, according to man, lasted for ten minutes. It seemed longer to those in the midst of it, with the Seventh Michigan losing more than one hundred men in the fray. Private Alan Price of the Sixth Michigan, observing the contest, later recalled, The Seventh Michigan made a charge and got all cut to pieces. It was the first charge they ever made, and it was awful work. Custer disagreed. I challenge the annuals of warfare to produce a more brilliant or successful charge of cavalry, he later wrote. Those who had been in the charge agreed wholeheartedly with that assessment. This is the most furious dragoon fight I have ever saw or engaged in, Dexter M. McComber of the 6th Michigan noted in his diary. A comrade in the same unit, Andrew Newton Buck, called it the hardest battle of the war. Cavalry never did such fighting before in America. Edward Corsilius of the 5th Michigan combined the sediments. Such fighting I never saw before, he wrote to his mother. It is an honor to belong to the Michigan Cavalry. At the time, carried away by excitement, Custer dashed forward into the open field beyond the fence, only to look back in horror and see the rest of the regiment still bogged down behind him. Hastily ordering the bugler to sound retreat, Custer had his men wheel about just as two fresh Confederate regiments, the 1st North Carolina and the Jeff Davis Legion, rode down to meet them. Fitzhugh Lee's vaunted 1st Virginia joined the charge. Custer was suddenly in danger of being cut off. We must get back behind the guns, he rather needlessly advised Captain Armstrong. The two rode for their lives. Colonel McIntosh arrived on the scene, exhorting the retreating soldiers to hold their positions. For God's sakes, men, if you are ever going to stand, stand now, for you are on your own free soil, he shouted. Colonel Russell A. Alger, 5th Michigan commander and later Secretary of War under President William McKinley, organized a volley into the enemy's onrushing flank. The Southerners recoiled and withdrew to comparative safety of Cresser's Ridge. Watching from the crest, Stuart worried that his men's inherent aggressiveness had carried them too far. The charge being very much prolonged, their horses, already jaded by hard marching, failed under it. Their movement was too rapid to be stopped by couriers, and the enemy perceiving it were turning upon them with fresh horses. Brigade Commander Wade Hampton of South Carolina shared Stewart's concern. Grabbing his personal colors, Hampton spurred the enormous warhorse, Butler, down the ridge toward his imperiled troopers, shouting for them to fall back. Major T.J. Barker, Hampton's adjunct, saw the colors waving through the smoke and mistakenly believed that he had signaled an all-out advance. Barker, gathering up the 1st and 2nd South Carolina regiments along with the Phillips Legion and followed Hampton into the maelstrom. Looking back over his shoulder, Hampton was shocked to see the entire brigade dashing after him. Nevertheless, his own blood was up. Charge them, my brave boys, charge them, he cried. The Union troopers watched the advance in open mouth wonder. Captain Miller of the 3rd Pennsylvania recorded the scene for posterity in an awestruck terms. A grander spectacle than their advances has rarely been beheld, he wrote. They marched with well-aligned fronts and steady reins. Their polished saber blades dazzled in the sun. 
All eyes turned upon them. Shell and shrapnel met the dancing Confederates and tore through their ranks, closing the gaps as though nothing had happened. On they came, and as they drew nearer, canister was substituted by our artillerymen for shell, and horse after horse staggered and fell. Still, they came on. Southern officers sought to maintain order amid the chaos. Keep to your sabers, men. Keep to your sabers, they urged. The Union gunners opened on the approaching horsemen, trying to slow them down. Horse and men fell head over heels, but the mass of Confederate riders kept advancing. They were simply too many of them to stop. The artillerymen rammed double shots of canister, one-inch steel balls packed tightly in cylinders, into their guns and fired point-blank at their attackers. Custer's old West Point comrade, Alexander Pennington, directed a dreadful havoc of shells into the Confederate ranks. On came the rebel cavalry, yelling like demons, right toward the battery we were supporting, sweeping everything before them, Union cavalryman George Kidd remembered. Gregg, taking personal charge of the battle, ordered a countercharge. Custer was quick to oblige. Riding up to his only uncommitted regiment, the 1st Michigan, he approached his commander, Colonel Charles H. Town, speaking with elaborate formality, perhaps as a way of keeping his own nerves steady. Custer said, Colonel Town, I shall have to ask you to charge, and I want to go in with you. Town, who was dying of tuberculosis, had to be strapped into his saddle before the battle. Some said he was courting a soldier's death on the battlefield to avoid wasting away in a consumptive's bed. Whatever his motivation, he obeyed immediately and got the regiment moving. It was now 3 p.m. Private Cassius Norton of Company M described the ensuing charge. We went out with a trot in columns of squadrons, he recalled. At the time the command charge was given, we bounded from a trot into a gallop. The hill and its sides towards us, crowded with screaming advanced rebels, headed for us. Three or four columns of them, while beyond our right was the shattered seventh, rallying as best they could here and there. Come on, you wolverines, Custer shouted again, vaulting from his stumbling charger, Roanoke, onto a nearby riderless horse and swiping at an oncoming rebel with his saber. Where a narrow lane crossed the farmland, the fighting peaked in intensity. Hampton, a strapping six foot two inches tall, towered over the battlefield. Several Union troopers, attracted by Hampton's massive figure and the glinting gold stars on his collar, raced to surround him. Hampton unhorsed one attacker with his sword, unloading his revolver at the others. Hemmed in against a fence, the general faced sure capture or death. Two Mississippians from the Jeff Davis Legion rode to his rescue, but were sabred off their horses by the milling Federals. Other swords sliced open Hampton's forehead and ripped through his uniform. With all his fast ebbing strength, Hampton raised his heavy sword and brought it down on attacker's head, splitting him open from crown to chin. Literally soaked in blood, the general reeled in the saddle while wary Federal troopers circled him, looking for an open to finish him off. At the critical moment, Sergeant Nat Price of the 1st North Carolina galloped into the melee, shooting down one Yank who was aiming a killing blow at Hampton's head. Other Confederates dashed to the general's aid as well. General, they are too many for us, Price cried. For God's sakes, leap your horse over the fence. I'll die before they have you. Although stunned by the near-fatal blows, Hampton leaped the fence to safety. In midair, a piece of shrapnel smashed into his side, almost unhorsing him, but the lifelong horseman kept the saddle and dashed up Cress's Ridge to safety, relinquishing command to Colonel Lawrence Baker of the 1st North Carolina as he was helped from his saddle. It would be several months before Hampton could return to active service. Intense personal combat was taking place all over the battlefield. Captain Walter Newhall, the 3rd Pennsylvania, spurred his mount toward the flag bearer from Hampton's brigade. Reaching out to seize the standard, Newhall was smashed in the face by the flag staff, opening a hideous wound in his jaw. Of the 22 men Newhall led into combat that day, 18 were killed or wounded. Small groups of Federals continued pecking away at the rebel flanks. 
One battalion, led by Captain Miller of the 3rd Pennsylvania, managed to penetrate the gray ranks and get into their rear, sowing more confusion in an already out-of-control situation. With, with the main thrust of the attack now blunted, and more and more Union riders appearing on their flanks and in their rear, the Confederates broke off the fight and galloped back towards Cress's Ridge. Miller's men pursued them as far as Rummel's farm, where one Union trooper had the top of his scalp sliced off as quickly and easily by a southern swordsman as if they had been scalped by an Indian, leaving him, said Miller, as neatly tonsured as a priest. For his leadership, Miller would later be awarded the Medal of Honor, making him the only Union soldier to win the nation's highest honor that day at Gettysburg. Stuart withdrew his forces from the ridge at sunset and reformed along the York Turnpike. Although inflicting 254 casualties, some 219 in Custer's brigade alone, to 181 of their own, Stuart's riders had failed to reach the Union rear. It would not have made any difference if they had. Pickett's charge had failed, and the entire Confederate army was in retreat. The Battle of Gettysburg was lost. Almost immediately, a second battle began, this time in the court of public opinion. Stuart was pillared unmercifully for his absence prior to the start of the battle, and many Southerners, including, by implication, Robert E. Lee, blamed Stuart for the disastrous defeat. Said a well-connected journalist in the Mobile Daily Advisor, his vanity seems to have controlled his actions, and the cavalry was used frequently to gratify his personal pride, and to the detriment of the service. At the Battle of Gettysburg, he was not to be found, and General Lee could not get enough cavalry together to carry out his plans. Stuart's supporters leaped to his defense. It was not the want of cavalry that General Lee bewailed, for he had enough of it had it been used properly, wrote Stuart's adjunct, Major Henry McClellan. It was the absence of Stuart himself that he felt so keenly. John S. Mosby, the scout whose initially misleading report had contributed much to Stuart's decision to continue his raid, blamed Brigadier General Beverly Robertson for not moving quickly enough to support Lee's infantry. The only thing I blamed Stuart for was not having him shot, wrote Mosby. The debate raged on for years after the war, and most historians have placed some of the blame to Stuart for the Confederate defeat at Gettysburg, while conceding that he had been given just enough autonomy by Lee to absolve him from any official misconduct. Stuart's aide, William Blackford, probably best summed up the cavalry battle at Rummel's farm. It was about as bloody and hot an affair as any we had yet encountered, Blackford wrote. The, the cavalry of the enemy were steadily improving, and it was all we could do sometimes to manage them. In the rolling farmland east of Gettysburg, on the third day of the largest battle of the Civil War, they had scarcely managed them at all. It's your history. Learn it. Know it. And love it. <laughs>